Today on Larry King Now, the legendary singer Tom Jones on his new memoir. Penguin Books, who I signed with, you know, in England, they said, we want the interesting stories. We want stories that that has um, molded your career. On his storied career, what was your biggest hit? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, the first one was, it's not unusual, but then what's new, Pussycat? You know, Delilah was huge all over the oh, world. Oh, Green Green Grass. Yeah. Green Green Grass. That's a sad, home. that's a great Yeah, and that came out the same time as the Vietnam War was going on. Plus, when did that women start throwing things at you? That was in the Copacabana in 1968. Um, I was they there. underwear? Yes. Well, it was, it, actually, it was a sexy thing at the beginning. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now, Sir Thomas Jones Woodward. Better known by his stage name, Tom Jones is one of the most popular vocalists to emerge from the British invasion. Since his Grammy win for Best New Artist in 1966, whew, Jones has solidified himself as one of music's most iconic figures with hits like What's New Pussycat, She's a Lady Sex Bomb, It's Not Unusual, Delilah, wow. Now he's put his storied career to paper with a new autobiography, Tom Jones Over the Top and Back, available everywhere now, as is his new album entitled Long Lost Suitcase. We'll talk about that. You're 75 years old. Yes. Was this memoir born out of nostalgia? Why did you write this? Um, well, a few reasons. There was uh, one reason being I'm 75, <laughs> and I've been in the business over 50 years now. And um, secondly, people were coming up to me with other books that people had written, you know, that were just sort of interviews and things that had been put together. And it, it used to say biography. And then people, would you sign your book for me, please? And I said, it's not my book. You know, these books were coming out, they, they, not my book. So, oh, really? Well, it says, you know, and I, I thought, well, now is the time to, to really- Your do, book. Uh, my book, yes. You call it a memoir? Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, yeah, an autobiography, really. And it's getting great reviews. Yes. Big story in USA Today. Mm -hmm. Did you write it? Yeah, well, I, I t um, there was a ghostwriter called yeah. Giles Smith. You work with him? Yes, but he, he wrote it. As I'm saying it, he's, ri he's writing it down. So when I, when I read it, I mean, it's like it's me. It's your language. Yes, exactly. Was it cathartic? It was. Um, were there parts hard to write? Not, not really, because uh, Penguin Books, who I signed with, you know, in, in England, they said we want the interesting stories. You want stories that that has um, molded your career. You know, that have gone, like in Wales, where, where I come from, the early years. You know, the first twenty-four years of my life was spent in in South Wales, coal mining area. You know, so we would your like to. My father was a coal miner. My father was a coal miner, and his two brothers were also coal miners. We all. All coal miners then. Did you ever go into the mines? No. I had uh, TB when I was uh, 12 to 14, mm -hmm. two years. I was bedridden for two years. And uh, I think it was a blessing in disguise because the doctor said, whatever you do, you don't go down the coal mine. Uh, my father wanted me to go and work with him, but it was out of the question after the, uh, after the TB. So that's what kept me out of there. Right, how did it feel to write the book? It felt great. I mean... Um, uh, Giles Smith, you know, he said, how much time will you give me? And, and I was doing The Voice UK then, you know, I was one of the coaches on, uh, on The Voice. So any time I would have between filming, I would give uh, to Giles. So I was like four hours a day we spent on it, uh, most of last year. And, um, so, so the, and, and he had written a book um, about Rod Stewart, you know, he, he, had, he, had, he had written the Rod Stewart's autobiography. And I said, how, how long did Rod give you? And he said, he gave me two hours a day. I said, well, how about four hours a day? Because <laughs> you know, I, I had the time. Uh, you've been labeled a ladies' man. You've been married to the same woman since you were 17. Yeah. You, you also admitted to straying at times outside the marriage. You write about that? No. No, I, I don't think it's important. You know, it's, it's, not what, it's not what has made me. I mean, I've always looked at um, entertainers as, you know, wh why is that person where he or she is? What's the talent? That's the main thing. 
uh, you know, the rest of it is, is part of life. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not what got you there. It's not what is the real person. You know, I, I remember um, uh, Kirk Douglas was on a Johnny Carson show once, and uh, he had written The Ragman's Son. Great book. You know, which was a really good book. But Johnny would not leave him alone. You know, he would say, you know, Kirk would say, well, you know, this is Ragman's Son. And he said, yes, all very well and good, but what about Lana Turner? You know, what about, and he, was, and he said, John, this is not, it's not about that. And he said, yes, but uh, this is what people, you know, and uh, I thought, my God, I hope I never go through that, you know, if I write a book. Well, so that stopped me from, from writing a book for a long time. Sinatra said that the personal side of his life hmm. is really not important. Exactly, and that's what this book is about. And the CD goes along with it, you know, the album, Long Lost Suitcase, because uh, they both came together at the same time. I was writing the book and I was recording these songs and they, the um, Ethan Johns, who was my producer for, for the album, said, this, this is like almost autobiographical. And I said, well, it's funny you should say it because I'm, <laughs> I'm writing it. I want to ask you about the album. Mm. Did, when did that women start throwing things at you? That was in the Copacabana in 1968. Um, I was there. Underwear? Yes. Well, it was, it, actually, it was a sexy thing at the beginning because the, the ladies were handing me table napkins, as you know, in the Copa. Oh, yeah. The singer is on the same level as where all the tables and chairs are. So they were handing me table napkins, you know, because I was perspiring. And this woman stood up and, you know, lifted her skirt and took them off and went like this. So I said, <laughs> you know, what you don't catch cold, you know, like it was like that. <laughs> so because when you, you know, work in, in uh, singing in workmen's clubs where I come from in South Wales, if somebody throws something at you, you try and turn it, you know, into a, an advantage. So that was it. But there was a columnist there at the time and he put it in, in his column, you know, the, 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 and then they would bring them in handbags and then it became a joke, you know, <laughs> and that was the problem. I became like a knicker magnet. But you did a you very know. sexy act. Well, yeah. You had all those moves, the Presley, and the, you, you did, yes. you moved. Yeah. You did not stand straight behind the microphone. Uh, no. No. <laughs> Up next, how does Sir Tom's new album compare to his earlier works? And I'll get his take on the rapidly changing music industry today. Tom Jones, more after this. The book is Tom Jones, Over the Top and Back. How does the new album, Long Lost Suitcase, compare to earlier works? Um, well, the, the, now I'm recording with, with Ethan Johnson. Uh, this is the third album that I've done with him. And when, um, when I started talking to him at the beginning, which is about six years ago now, I think, um, he said, I hear things in your voice that, that people haven't heard yet, I don't think. You know, he said, because every single recording that I had out to date were all, always had big arrangements on them. You know, it's not unusual, What's New Pussycat, The Green Green Grass of Home, Delilah, you know, they're all big sounding records with, with, the, with big arrangements. So we said, why don't we get back to the start, like when you were in Wales, what kind of stuff were you singing in those pubs and clubs? And I said, well, they were basically 50s rock and roll music, and even before that, uh, gospel music and blues and country, you know, American roots music if you like, you know, and, and, and that's what, what I was doing. So he said, well, why don't we get back to that? Why don't we go into the studio with a few musicians, pick a few songs, pick a few keys, and try them, try them out? These are songs from the fifth, they're not new songs. Uh, no, no, they were all uh, a mixture of songs. He said, songs that you want to sing. So maybe, like what kind of songs? Well, they, um, well, there's a Willie Nelson one now on, on, on this last album uh, called Opportunity to Cry, you know, which is really, you know, to it. And then there's songs on this one um, called, there's one that um, Lonnie, Lonnie Johnson did called uh, um, Tomorrow Night, you know, which, which is a, an old song, and Raise a Ruckus, you know, which is an old campground song. Explain the title, Long Lost Suitcase. Right. Well, um, as you know, when you're on the road a lot, you live out of a suitcase. And then when I get home in LA, because I live in Los Angeles, um, I take out stuff out of a suitcase that I that I need, but there's a lot of things left in there. So over the over the long period of time, I have a lot of these suitcases with stuff in them, you know, in a warehouse. So I started getting stuff out and old photographs, and old cassettes, and old eight tracks even, you know, and some old 45s, songs that that I'd forgotten about, you know, some of them, and that I'd always wanted to do. 
and I haven't got around to it yet. So with the book and the album at the same time, I had a lot of pictures that I found that I thought I'd lost, you know, and some of the songs that I thought I'd lost were there. So that's why I call it the long lost suitcase. Good idea. Because it came out of that. You know? I told CBS Sunday morning that time is my enemy. Yeah. You still feel that way? Yeah, because that's the thing that's going to stop me. It's time. You're never going to retire, right? No, never. And thank God my voice is still as strong as it ever was, you know, at 75. You know, Ethan John's my producer. He said, there's no way a man should sound like this at 75. You know, it's... <laughs> it's and, and I said, well... You haven't lost anything. No, mm -hmm. nothing. You, we have had so many types of artists here lately complaining about the music industry. It's not in a good place. Do you share that view? Uh, I don't know. Because to me, it's basically the same. You know, music, um, when I started in, in the 60s, it was always youth-driven. You know, they're always looking for young talent. And I don't think that's changed. That's the same. The record industry has changed, though. The record industry, yes. Uh, you know, how, how you get your uh, product out there is, is different now. You know, you don't go... ITunes. Yeah, and, and the singles are not what they used to be. You know, the 45s. Mm -hmm. Well, they used to be 78s, of course. But then 45s. You know, a lot of people would buy singles. And then the album. You know, you'd make a single or two singles, and then you'd make an album. What was your biggest hit? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, the first one was It's Not Unusual, but then What's New Pussycat? You know, Delilah was huge all over oh. the world. You know. Long lost home, gone back home. Yeah, you know, so it's all... Uh, green, green grass. The green, green grass of home. That's a sad, that's a great... Yeah, song. and that came out the same time as the Vietnam War was going on. What do you make of Adele? Adele, well, the, the, um, she, has, she has a lovely voice, and um, she appeals to a lot of people, which I think is great, because she is a singer-singer. You know, she gets up in front of the microphone, no... You know, uh, dancing Football, girls, yeah. Or, yeah, you know, and, and fireworks and stuff. You know, she just sings and people love it. So it is, she gives other singers hope, you know, that are coming into the business. Because with electronics the way they are now, there's a lot of electrical sounding records, you know, with auto tuner. You know what I mean? That if you're, if you're out of tune, they, could, they put you in tune now. But Adele sings very much in tune. You collaborated on a single with Jack White. Mm. What was it like working with him? It was great. He, he wanted me to just go in there and sing live. He had the band there. And we did uh, Jezebel, which is an old Frankie Lane song, which oh, I, I, knew, I knew very well. And an old Howling Wolf song as well that we did. Are there young artists that impress you today? Yeah, there's, um, there's a girl, an American girl that I, that I saw. Her name is uh, Tori, um, Tori Kelly. She's really good. She's a singer, songwriter, you know, plays guitar, looks great, sounds great, plays guitar. And there's a, a guy in England called James Bay, who is almost like the, the, the male equivalent of, of what she does. You know, he's a good looking kid, plays, writes his own songs, plays guitar, sings. Now, tell good. me about, did you get in trouble with the gay community? Did you, did you make a statement about homosexuals? Oh, that, well, this. Clear it up for me. Okay. I recorded with a man called Joe Meek in 1963. And, um, you know, it's homosexual, which I didn't know about. And so um, I said in, in, a, in, a, in a news interview, when they said, uh, what was Joe Meek like? Was he, he was a weird guy, wasn't he? Because he was a bit of an eccentric. He, he killed himself. He committed suicide, shot his landlady and shot himself with a shotgun. You know, he was a, an eccentric. And, um, and they said, anything else about him? I said, well, you know, he was homosexual. I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. You know, this is 1963. And I said, you know, I didn't know. I just thought he was an ordinary guy like anybody else. Well, they said, Tom Jones doesn't think homosexuals are normal. No, I said, I thought he was a normal guy like everybody else. And they said, Tom Jones doesn't think the homosexuals oh. are normal. I said, I never said that. I was referring to, that way, yeah. no, to Joe Meek. You know, and I have a man that's um, uh, my stylist, the man that gets all my clothes for me in England, who is gay. So he was on Twitter right away when he saw this, you know, this, and he was on my side. And a lot of, you know, a lot of gay people are. I know a lot of gay people. I'm not. And then they said I was homophobic, <laughs> you know, because I said this about Joe Meek from 1963. It's unbelievable. Coming up, what famous artist would Tom most like to collaborate with? What's his favorite city to perform in? And does he have any regrets? Stay with us. New album is Long Lost Suitcase. The new book is Tom Jones, Over the Top and Backed.
He's still with us, and he's going to be around forever, I think, the magic sound of Tom <laughs> Jones. Over the years, there's been a lot of When I first heard you, I guess the first was It's Not Unusual. Yep. And I thought you were black. Right. And many people thought yes. you were black, right? Mm-hmm. You recently said that a lot of people still think I'm black. When I first came to America, people heard me sing on the radio. I was surprised to learn I was white. Hmm. Did you even think it of checking if you had some black in your in your DNA? Yeah. Well, again, uh, a reporter said to me, "Would you be um, uh, what's the word uh, against? Not against, but another word for it. Amenable. Uh, or would you be opposed to it? That's what he said. Would you be opposed to a, a DNA test? And I said, No, I wouldn't be opposed to it. You know, and that was it. So now in the paper, Tom Jones is getting a DNA test to find out whether he's black or not. Well, I, I never said that. <laughs> so, but I still haven't got it you done You think yet. you might have some? Maybe so, you know, because... Um, so, I mean, your voice certainly sounds... Yes. Like and, Frankie and, Lane, too. People thought that about Frankie Lane. I know. He sang Shine. Yes, exactly. So I remember when, when I was a, a kid in school and I sang the Lord's Prayer... And the teacher said to me, why are you singing this like a Negro spiritual? And I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, I don't know, miss. I'm just singing it the way I feel. So I, I was thinking maybe I'd heard Mahalia Jackson sing it, you know, on the radio. Maybe. But I was always influenced by um, gospel music and the blues, and which was nine times out of ten were black people singing them and performing those songs. So, you know, that's... That's where it was coming from. But it was definitely rubbing off on me, and I was singing like that in school. It's a great compliment, by the way. Definitely. Okay. Uh, we're going to play a quick game of You Only Knew. I'll just throw some questions at you. Okay. You remember the first girl you kissed? My wife. She, really? Yes, when we were kids. How old were you when you met? Um, about 10, I think. Really? Yeah, 9 or 10. She was from Wales, too? Yeah, yeah, she went to school together. Favorite city to perform in? Oh my God, that's 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 a hard one. Uh, favorite city to perform in London. An artist you'd most like to collaborate with? Uh, James Bay, is a young guy who writes great songs, and uh, the girl I was telling you about, uh, Tori Kelly, Kelly, she writes as well. Guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. Um, Aha. Cuban cigars. Craziest fan encounter. I guess throwing panties at you. Uh, no, it was crazier than that. I was in a, um, what you call a truck stop in this country. It was a, um, a transport calf in, in England. And I had gone into the t toilet. My band were all there using the urinal. And I was actually in the booth. And some girls had seen me walk in there. And the girl came up over the top of the door. On While top of sitting me. On the While I'm sitting on Jumped on top of you. Exactly. And what I and, and I pushed it out to the door, and I said, you know, can't I, even you know, <laughs> in peace. And she said, and I pushed her out the door. You know, I said, this is disgusting. She said, you are disgusting. You have bad manners, and I never, I never buy another one of your records again. <laughs> Good. So that was the most embarrassing. I would say, what's a pet peeve? Uh, pet. Well, a pet peeve. I hate bullies. I hate to see. Kids getting bullied, especially nowadays, because some kids... Terrible. You know, I mean, they, they take it... It's, it's, it's terrible now. Hidden talent. Hidden talent. Uh, I whistle. Favorite song of your own? Um, well, favorite and most important is It's Not Unusual, because that changed my life. So it's got... How'd you get that song? I, I did a demo. It was a de I was a demo singer in, in England because my manager used to write songs, and I did a demo on it for Sandy Shaw. She was a girl singer. Remember her, yeah. And she'd already had two number one records, so my manager wrote this song with Les Reed, and he had me demo it. And when I heard it back, I said, Gordon, please, this is my song. And Sandy Shaw said the same thing. When she heard it, she said, whoever's singing this, that's his song. Did that take off right away? Yep, oh. it came out in January 65. It was number one by March the 1st. It's the most important thing in your life. Well, my health, I would say. Something you'd like to accomplish, still like to accomplish? Um, I would like to make a good movie. you never been in a movie? No, not really. I've, you know, I've done little bits and pieces, but uh, that's a regret that I, I would have liked to have had a go at it when I was young. 
you know, and because I didn't. And you always think you've got loads of time. Did you know Engelbert Humperdinck early yeah. on? Because the two of you were associated. You both had hits coming from England. Oh, yeah. Well, we had the same manager, you see. So, oh, did you? Yeah, Gordon Mills. And um, so when when I had It's Not Unusual and then The Green, Green Grass of Home. What's new, Pussy got Then The Green, Green Grass of Home. So uh, there was a song called Release Me that I had recorded. And Gordon said, do you want it as a single? I said, I don't think it's a single. He said, do you mind if Jerry does it? Because his name is Jerry Dorsey. I said, no, I don't mind. And he did it, and then boom. And he, then Gordon got the name Engelbert Humperdinck. Because he, he took that name, right? Yes, because he was a German composer. He wrote Hansel and Gretel. And Gordon <laughs> saw it in a book. He said, I've got a name for Jerry Dorsey. Because he had to get him a new name, because he'd been recorded under, under that name before. And he said, Engelbert Humperdinck. I said, Gordon, please. <laughs> you know, please. So, yeah, who knew? Who knew? Next, we will wrap things up with some fan questions from social media for the great Tom Jones. Don't click away. The book is Tom Jones Over the Top and Back, and the new album is Long Lost Suitcase. We got a lot of social media questions for you. Okay. Kathy Moran on Facebook. Has he ever had or would he consider doing some Shakespeare on stage? He looks and has a voice that would be perfect. Um, yes, it would be a hard task, but I remember um, meeting Edward G. Robinson in 1968 Great when idea. I was at the Flamingo, and he said, you should do King Lear. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? He said, yes, you have the, the stature and you have the voice for it, so do it. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll definitely think about it, <laughs> so who knows? At Diane NC on Twitter, at 75 years old, your voice is still amazing. Unlike many other singers who, who age, how do you do it? Uh, well, first of all, it's a God-given gift, and God is still good to me. My health is good. Uh, but I, I've learned to uh, drink a lot of water, don't get dehydrated, and get sleep. Sleep and water, I think, are very, very important. Tony Bennett still hangs on. Yeah. When I see him, you know, I mean, he's 89. Uh, I know. I, I, was on the I was in the Grammys with him, and I said, you're my hero. You know, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Alan Hankowitz on Facebook. What was the most vile thing thrown on you at stage? Oh, on stage. my God. Vile. Vile. I don't think I've ever had anything vile. Kevin Chouinard on the Larry King Now blog. Who taught you those fantastic and unique dance moves, second to James Brown? Um, I just, it just came naturally to me. It's a natural thing that I do. No one taught you anything? No. Uh, Nick Valeski on Facebook. When you saw Carlton doing his dance for the first time, what did you think? <laughs> so, well, it was it was flatter, it flattering, you know, for anybody to, to, to do that. Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Fresh Prince of Bel Air, yeah. Deborah Miner on Facebook. Please talk about meeting Morrissey and becoming friends. We just had him as a guest. Right. What do you think of some of the things he said is about the recording industry? Would you do shows with Morrissey? Uh, yeah, I did a show with Morrissey a couple of years ago in L.A., and uh, he's a very nice man. Very nice. And, um, you know, he's, he's always been a fan of mine, I'm, I'm glad to say. And I'm a fan of his because I think he's made some really, really interesting records. And he, and he writes. Very you know, some, well. Yes, yes. He's a very, he's an educated man, a lovely man. Darsh and DC on Facebook, love your songs. Was there really a Delilah in your life? No. No, that song was How written... How did you get that song? Uh, it was written by Les Reed, the man that wrote or co-wrote It's Not Unusual, and I was looking for a new song. So my manager, Gordon Mills, went to Les's house. He said, you got anything for Tom? And he said, well, I just wrote this song uh, called Delilah. Give it Great a listen. arrangement. Yeah. So then we... Uh, now, you kill a guy, right, in Delilah? You are uh, a murderer. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's about a man with a knife. I felt the knife in my hand, you know. And Sheila, no, he doesn't kill the guy. He kills Delilah. Oh, well, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he kills her. And she laughed no more because, you know, he finds out that she'd been fooling Was that around. recorded in London? Or yes, yeah. in London. Andrea Day, what's the best memory of your career? Oh, my God. Uh, well, the most important thing is being knighted by the Queen. You know, I've been knighted. What was that like? It was tremendous. It was, uh, it was a little scary at first when they, they said... They really put a yes, sword Yes, yes, she put the... Yes, she does. And um, when I was first told about it, I, I thought, what, what do I have to do? I mean, do I have to change my lifestyle? I mean, is, is there anything that I have to do? But then I thought, well, um, Elton John, Paul McCartney, and um, 
Mick Jagger and now Van Morrison as well. But uh, Van is only this year. But then I thought, well, I'm in good company. If I'd been the first singer, you know, if they to be knighted, then I would have thought, oh, oh. But uh, there, there were other people. Uh, and when they well. say it, did they say Tom Jones or was it Sir Thomas Jones Woodward? Sir Thomas Jones Woodward. Sir Thomas and Anna. Larry, nice to see you. I want to thank Tom Jones, Sir Tom Jones. The new book and album are available now on iTunes. The book is Over the Top and Back. The album is Long Lost Suitcase. And you can find me on Twitter at Kings Things. And I'll see you next time.